So Susan, welcome here in, in Utrecht. Thank you. You just gave your, your, your keynote over here at, 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 at the Sharing Academy yeah. workshop uh, from the University of Utrecht. Uh, you talked about the, 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 the car sharing uh, and, and, and sharing in, in, in mobility, about the, the past, the present and the future. So let's right. start with the past. I think okay. it's also because many people are forgetting to, to look to the past when you're looking to the future. So about sharing and car sharing uh, in, in, in the past. So what are your most interesting insights about that? Well, I think a lot of these things are not new. They've been with us for a very long time. So car sharing started in 1947 in Switzerland. A group called Cephage was a co-op, and they were actually still in operation when I was doing my doctoral dissertation work. And they closed in 1997, so they were actually 50 years old. And that was the first incidence. And then also in the 1970s, actually in the Netherlands, there was a company called Wickcar. So there's been a long history of car sharing going on for a very, very long time. It's nothing new, but now we have a lot of advanced technologies that make it possible to do things that weren't possible in the past, like providing point-to-point -point mobility services like car to go and drive now. So I love to look at the past so that it helps to inform the present as well as the future. And you also uh, presented a research from 2008. Uh, there are quite some impressing uh, figures. Uh, yeah, uh, can yeah. you share some about that? Yeah, so we led a study at University of California, Berkeley on North American car sharing. So we had all of the largest operators in Canada and in the United States, including Zipcar. And we had about 10,000 uh, responses. So it was a very, very big sample size. And we were able to look at a number of metrics that are pretty popular in the car sharing space, like number of cars reduced per car sharing vehicle. So we actually calculated nine to 13 vehicles are either sold or postponed due to a car sharing purchase or, or a car sharing vehicle, excuse me. And so actually four to six of those are sold vehicles. The rest are uh, suppressed or postponed car purchases. We also see uh, vehicle kilometers traveled reduced, uh, ranging from 27 to 43%. We see similar ranges in terms of greenhouse gas emission reductions. So in terms of a transportation demand management strategy, it's a very meaningful one because it gets people to think differently about their car. Instead of thinking about a car as a fixed asset, it turns it into a variable cost, which means people are gonna travel differently when they use a car they're going to think much more carefully about it. So we see a lot of mode shifting towards things like walking, cycling, carpooling more, and using public transportation. And did you also did research uh, on peer-to-peer uh, -peer car sharing? Uh, yes, so we're actually doing a study on peer-to-peer -peer car sharing uh, right now uh, with a number of the, the major operators, but unfortunately I can't uh, provide any of the results at this po point in time, but we should be releasing those really soon. Okay. And, and, and what was the reason that you didn't include peer-to-peer -peer in 2008? Because it was just too young and not existing then or? Well, actually peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, came onto the horizon in 2010. So yes, so the study we did in 2008 reflects the round trip car sharing model. So we also have another study underway looking at five North American cities using the one-way car sharing model. And so we're also gonna be re releasing those results. So we're gonna be doing a lot of numbers and data, data crunching this summer. And so stay tuned. Cool, cool. <laughs> and, 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 and uh, last question about the, the research from 2008, because the really, the, the numbers were incredible. Uh, but in the end, when you look at, okay, what kind of people did answers? Are the numbers not, not, not uh, can you be critical about the numbers because Maybe you interviewed the early adopters uh, uh, that, are, that are really enthusiastic and maybe the next phase of people getting in when, it, when it's scaling up uh, will be a, a complete different group. So That's maybe a really it's, good It's, 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 it's good. interesting to do the same research again, but now um, uh, six years later. Yeah, we would love to replicate that study and see you know, has the, the, the market changed? You know, are we going through the diffusion curve? Uh, was I looking at early adopters? I mean, car sharing started in the United States in 1998, in Canada in 1994. So I was doing it in 2008, which was a decade later. But I could very well have had brand new users inside that s service. So I think what we have seen in that particular study is a lot of the people tend to be younger, well-educated, upwardly mobile people living in urban areas. And one of the big questions that we still have is, you know, when is it going to start to reflect more baby boomers or more Gen Xs? And uh, Zipcar actually just released a study that is suggesting that a number of its users are actually baby boomers now who are coming back to the city centers after their children grow up. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's it's, it's because because it's it's I think uh, 
also the need uh, and, and also the use and, and, and the hybrid model of, of, of owning or, or access will also change in your life. Like I now have, have, have two kids, my youngest is, is, is four months. So I just want a really big car uh, uh, in front of my house to get all the stuff inside. But maybe in five years I'll say, okay, it's okay. Not, 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 you don't not need the car anymore. seats, you don't need all of the, the baby equipment. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I was recently asked that question by an automaker is, you know, are, when the millennials or the axes have kids, do, do their lives change? And I think the answer is of, of course. But is that, is that a sustainable choice towards auto ownership or will they go back to other forms of mobility? And interestingly, you know, car sharing really wasn't popularized you know at the time when baby boomers didn't have kids so the fact that they are going back to cities and starting to use these services is an indication that perhaps these types of services are mainstreaming yeah yeah and and and, and, and we're all really positive about uh, the, the the increase of numbers of people are sharing cars uh, but in the end when you look at okay um, are the cars or, or some services like car to go uh, but also like uber x are they competing with normal car uh, ownership or are they competing with public uh, because when i look at myself i never use a taxi only when i had to uh, go, go, go to the airport at, uh, at four o'clock in the morning because i think it was too expensive and too much hustle but now i'm using uh, uber pop uh, uber x in the netherlands uh, uh, and normally these trips i would uh, I, I would have made by a bicycle or by public transport so so is it, is it fair to 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 make this 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 announcements about the results uh, when you don't really know okay what kind of transports uh, do they uh, uh, right well I think that some of these new services we don't know enough about and the other thing that I think is happening right is it's an ecosystem of services now it's you know back in 2008 when I was doing the round trip car sharing analysis it was round trip car sharing so that was the thing that you would study but now when you actually go in and study a city, you have to take account for is there a bike sharing service, is there a car sharing service, are people carpooling, are people using these new services? We call them ride sourcing, this idea that you source rides off of an app-based platform. So like Uber, Uber Pop is, a, is an example. We also have Lyft. Um, and so how are people making trade-offs in their decisions and are they traveling differently? And one, I think, unanswered question is what is this doing to auto ownership? And is it one of these services in particular that's pulling somebody away from auto ownership, or is it the collection of choices for that the individual that would uh, reduce the number of ho uh, household vehicles that they yeah, own? Yeah, really interesting. And we I, don't know. No, no, but that, that's cool stuff about this time. <laughs> we don't know. There's so many questions in there, uh, and, and every keynote there will be more questions at the end. So, but yeah, I mean, we're we're really just at the beginning of this, yeah. which was one of the comments that uh, I started with. Is yeah. you know, I've been researching shared mobility for 20 years, and um, it, this is really just getting started. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, I got uh, quite some feedback from, from, from the more traditional people I know from the consultants that you say to say, okay, uh, because I also went to WeShare Fest uh, two weeks ago in oh, Paris uh, and I brought two old school consultants with me to introduce themselves in the world of the creative economy. And they say something really interesting. They say, okay, Martijn, I hear a lot of discussions and talks about processes and about technique, but no discussion about, about people. And the same also uh, with here in Utrecht. Uh, many uh, discussions are about about uh, things, also research about things you can measure, well, not easily, but uh, 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 that, that, that you can measure uh, with uh, with numbers, carbon footprint, that kind of things. But there are hardly any discussions about social impact. Yeah, yeah, and I, that's a lot of the work that we're focused on. Uh, we're really interested in how this, uh, these types of services affect quality of life, so we're developing new indices to study that. So stay tuned, we're going to have a lot more research that I think is going to go into different dimensions of the social and environmental benefits and impacts of these types of services. And, and, and talking about sustainable business models, yeah, you also uh, had quite some figures about bike sharing. Yes. Uh, but when you look about sustainability of, of, of the business model, yes. uh, I think the Netherlands, the, the Netherlands is, is, is one of the few countries in the world where, uh, where bike sharing, uh, because all the bikes are from the real stations, uh, uh, they are not losing money in it. But I also heard some stories about the bike sharing in, in London, where they say, okay, with the cost of one year bike sharing in London, we can give every user a bike for, for the same amount of money. So, so yeah, I think it's early days in the business model of bike sharing. You know, bike sharing came on the scene. It's been growing rapidly since about 2008. And, you know, I think it's been moving so quickly, it's almost difficult to reflect and to determine, you know, what types of adjustments need to be made to the business models because 
new cities are replicating the previous business models that were implemented. So we need more time, I think, for reflection and understanding. We just actually did a study on Bay Area bike share in the, mm -hmm. in the San Francisco area, looking at pricing and the casual user. And we found that actually 53% of people who approached the bike sharing station and looked at the pricing didn't understand it. They thought it was actually much cheaper to use than it would have been. And they didn't understand that they needed to redock every 30 minutes. So they, you know, if they had actually used it or did use it, they could have been charged much more than they thought they were paying for access to it. So some of it is just even also education and understanding yeah. about how to use these services. And, and I think we're in such early days of even understanding, you know, what bike sharing can be doing. Uh, that I think we need to give it, give it a little time, and um, but you know the the environmental and social benefits I think uh, could be rather significant. If you shift somebody away from an uh, internal combustion engine for their commute into a bike, you know the environmental benefits and the congestion relief benefits are going to be notable. Yeah, and, and, and also interesting what you just said about people not understanding uh, with the bike sharing uh, the, yeah. the rates. Do you think, especially? I don't think uh, partly uh, it's about education and level of, of, of uh, well, how smart you are or how, or, or how you want to say it, but it's also about uh, a lack of, of, of interest. Do you think that's uh, like with car sharing, people really understand uh, uh, the costs of sharing their car uh, about about uh, uh, the extra? No, no, that's a really great question. Is is time and time again we f we find out that people do not understand the cost of the car, nor do they ex understand that the taxes that go into the road that are subsidizing the use of the car, right? So that's, I think, one of the things that makes it difficult for people to think about using other modes is once they invest in this fixed cost, you know, they think, oh, the use is just already paid for. But when you break it down into a variable cost, and people think much more differently about the use of a private auto, and that's one of the things you see in car sharing. But I think one of the challenges, right, is to, spread this, mainstream this to other populations. So I think we're gonna need a lot more government support in terms of positive uh, reinforcing public policies, but also more education and outreach as to, you know, what can this option do for you? And if now you have 150 to $450 more per month, which was another statistic that I provided, what could you do with that money? Yeah, and are you, are you spending the money on things that will in increase your carbon footprint or not? And it's really, and, and, and last thing, because we heard the bells, we have to go to your workshop. <laughs> and I see you think, ah, I have to go. The future. Uh, in, in 10 years, we, we all have an, uh, self driving cars. I, I can't wait because I think <laughs> car driving is a waste of my time. Who will own these cars? Well, I think it's going to be a range of different things, right? I think there will be people who own them. You know, I've heard estimates of them costing about $80,000. So there, there'll be people who, uh, like myself, might buy one and then put it into a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing setting so that after it takes me to the transit station it's off providing mobility to other people and it's helping me pay for that car so i think it's going to be a range of a whole different set of business models and one of the things i've thought about is you know does the sharing economy actually sort of converge you know do these ride sourcing services and car sharing services that are all very distinct right now kind of converge into one model of shared mobility that's yeah. provided by yeah. cars that are co-owned or owned by a, a company or just individuals who choose to have their own yeah. autonomous yeah. vehicle but you know the future we is know. unclear yeah, how you know how adopting people human beings are going to be of this technology as well as government policy yeah yeah there are quite some 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 <laughs> things to fix uh, mm -hmm. but also the other one uh, because i think also another scenario is, is that peer to peer is as a temporary thing like snapcar yeah uh, they, they'll say okay we won't exist in 10 years like this because then the problem of 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 of, of idle cap capacity is solved because of really effective self-driving cars so but really they but they could be part of the whole market mechanism, right? Because yeah, they, they, uh, I'm the owner. <laughs> I'm the owner of the car. I put it into the Snap Car service, and yeah. and Snap Car takes yeah. care of the all of the rentals and and transactions for me, and I get I guess a check at the end of the month. Yeah, yeah. Helps me pay off that eighty thousand dollar lease that I have on that vehicle. So yeah. so I think a lot of things could change, and I think with you know information technology, electric vehicle technology, and all of these. Uh, automated vehicle technologies. The future, I hope, is really bright. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I view myself as as uh, really privileged to live in a world that needs reimagining. And so, uh, you know, let's see how this goes. Yeah. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. And enjoy your stay